So hello, my name is Mika McKinnon, and I am a freelance scientist, which I swear is a real job. Uh, and how it's relevant today is that I get most of my work by being curious and excited in public about science. And as you might notice, I am a woman, which can lead to some conflicts and make me into a target for all sorts of fun things. And yet I can't just retreat and hide in a little cave because if I do, I don't get work anymore. So I'm going to be coming from the practical perspective of how do you find some sort of balance in the risk reward of participating in public while simultaneously trying to stay alive and healthy. Um, and I'm Rebecca Hiles. I'm a sex educator and dating coach called the Frisky Fairy. I'm located up in uh, up in Philly. And similarly, sex educator and dating coach is also a real job. Yeah. <laughs> you would have thought. Surprise! Um, All great sorts job. of real jobs. <laughs> but and it also is a job that requires me to be public and to you know be really outspoken about what I'm thinking and what I'm saying and like how to be active in my community. Um, communities, plural. Um, but that of course means that I also get a lot of feedback from people who feel that my opinions are incorrect um, and so from mine I mean I can come from the practical standpoint but moreover I tend to come from more of the like emotional standpoint of like how to focus on self-care how to sort of get yourself past the point when you want to just scream and throw your computer out the window because you simply cannot breathe anymore and alas we used to have a lawyer on this panel but he has been detained by other life circumstances so we do not have the legal side of things covered so we'll kind of touch up against them but it's alas that is our invisible partner here we saved a microphone for him um so let's see where should we start with this then um let's get a kind of a feel for where things are at in the room um how many people have received targeted online harassment how many people are afraid they might how many people are kind of um, uh, you choose what sort of activities you engage in in public because of a fear of harassment okay so we're definitely uh, uh, this, this is kind of good because it means that most of the people in the room are on the proactive side of there's concern, but not yet have a SWAT team show up at your door, which is great. We, we like being on this side because it means we can do more things in advance to keep you safe. Um, I don't want to like monologue up here, so I'm trying <laughs> to figure out like how to hand things back and forth. Would it be? Well, I guess we can talk about like various ways in which we've like been harassed. I think that that Go might for be it. a... Yep, right. sounds good. Uh, so I had two very distinct instances of harassment beyond the usual, like, oh, man, feminist skank kind of thing, um, <laughs> which is, like, a daily occurrence. Um, the two instances I'm talking about, one of which uh, actually had nothing to do with my public persona. It was, like, a personal life thing, but I think that it counts, so I'm going to bring oh, it yeah. up. Um, so the first one, I wrote an article um, about vaccinations, um, and how I feel about anti-vaxxers. Um, I have some very loud opinions about that. You feel free to come up and talk to me about them. I really love talking about those opinions. <laughs> but I got featured on um, an anti-vax page wherein like 2,000 people commented, like individual people commented on like the post and some of them came over to mine and they were like blowing up my comments. And I keep a very like lax policy on my comments as long as you don't threaten someone um, or are like so incredibly ist that like, like don't call somebody the N-word, like please, like that's inappropriate. I mean, there are a lot of other inappropriate things, but once you get to that like level of like horribleness, then I'm like, uh, maybe let's, and I'm not above editing people's comments before they go live either. Um, but yeah, they just like blew up my comments and it, there was one person in there who I checked because I would keep going back to the Facebook group because once I found out where that it was coming from Facebook, I plugged my, um, 
post into the search bar and it popped up in the group and I was like oh look at that I can see this now and so I went back through and I like one person went through and she found my and this was when I was only operating as the frisky fairy I didn't have it attached to my personal account um, but she found my personal Facebook account she found my work Facebook account. She found my phone number, my email address. Um, now, granted, my phone number was my Google Voice number, so that's not like a, a big deal because I put that, I leave that public. Um, she found like all of these different sites that I have accounts on, including ones that I don't have like associated with my work. And I was sitting there and I'm like, wow eventually i went back through and i like posted a comment to like a reply to somebody's comment that was like and you know please feel free to tell so and so on the facebook page that while i really appreciate her doing all this research on me that it would be really polite if she stopped trying to find me in person that would be great thanks um and then they eventually blocked me from the page because of course of course and so there's a couple of things in there that are actually really common elements of a storyline of this um so one of the things you did about maintaining situational awareness by watching once information is leaked keeping an eye on what it is and what's happening that's a really good way of being able to cut off threats before they happen um so this is this is kind of a reactionary instead of a proactive thing it's if it's already too late and you're already a target finding out what people are saying how they're coordinating and what they're planning is a really really good way of being able to understand are they making 500 pizza deliveries to your address are they, uh, how much information have they found, and is it right? Uh, people have doxed me repeatedly with information for addresses in states I've never lived in. Uh, so sometimes it's completely inaccurate. It's good fun then. I um, feel bad for the people. Oh, yeah. Well, as far as I could tell, it was a fictional address. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> like the, the go ahead. Because I would really, there. really suck if somebody was like oh, yeah. having pizza, if like some 80 year old grandmother that was like, I what? didn't order any pizza. Exactly. It's like 2 a.m. Oh, it's horrible for everybody involved. And you also had a go Google phone number, which is a really, really handy thing. So, uh, one of the problems with having your personal information released is that it's where does it come from in the first place? Sometimes it can be lax privacy settings. And that grows increasingly common as privacy settings get more and more complicated. But assuming the basic standard of you've gone through, you've locked down your privacy on accounts, you understand how your settings work, well then that information is coming from government records that were are accessible through Freedom of Information Act or, or even sometimes just available because governments have not yet caught up with the concept of privacy very well. Or it's people you willingly gave information to who are now abusing it. And this is something really common. Um, uh, so uh, my background, my academic background is in physics, astronomy, and geophysics. So I'm very tied into the astronomy community where we're having some very high profile instances of sexual harassment in astronomy recently. Well, that does verge onto the online aspect of some of there is one person we've identified who likes to get the phone numbers of women grad students and then just batch call them for months and months and months and Ew. months. Uh, so Google phone numbers that you can disable and switch to a new phone number or use when you don't really necessarily trust who you're talking to, just have effectively a set of disposable phone numbers is a really nice precautionary tool. Also useful in, say, dating when you're not quite sure if you like this person that much yet or if you're meeting people at a convention or you're meeting up <laughs> for one night in town or whatever it is that you're doing where you don't really know somebody all that well, having temporary phone numbers is really useful. Um, the Google Voice phone number is also really handy for my next portion of harassment um, in that it allows you to block people's phone numbers. So I, I've got my Google Voice number years ago, right? Um, like when it was first a thing and I was like, that sounds fantastic, I'm going to do that now. Um, and so I got it and I like have been using it for a long time and my ex-husband um, he didn't have my device number because we always just use Google Voice right I had his device number because he called out from it but I always just texted because um, I have the memory of a goldfish and I like to make sure everything I say is in text so that I don't forget that I said it <laughs> um, but when we started our divorce process uh, it became like a big chaotic thing they made me homeless. My husband, and, or my ex-husband and his girlfriend made me homeless. Uh, I left and took half of what was in the joint bank account, as is my legal right <laughs> in the state of Virginia. Um, 
and his girlfriend prior to this prior to all of this i had blocked her on twitter i had blocked um him on twitter like i just i wanted to have a space a safe space right like a a safe space on the internet. Mm-hmm. Hilarious, right? Yeah. Um, to do. <laughs> I wanted a place that was safe on the internet that was mine. And so, like, a thing happened, and they, like, um, they kicked me out, and uh, she created fake accounts on, um, on Twitter to attack me on my business account. Uh, she wrote long, in-depth posts attacking my character on her personal Facebook account. I have people who screenshotted the shit out of all that. I also did. But with my Google Voice number, I was able to make sure that after the third time that she called me, uh, I was able to block her number. And anytime I picked up a phone call and it was her or my ex-husband, I was able to block those numbers so that they couldn't continue to do that. At a certain point, they'd have to stop. <laughs> they couldn't keep like finding phones. Um, and like, But the harassment sometimes does lead offline that yeah. online sometimes turns offline and in this case uh she came to my work and keyed my car oh harassed Good. like she came into my work she like trashed me to my boss and then she went out and keyed my car and i was like what is my life right now because <laughs> up until that point i had only experienced harassment like on the internet i had never experienced mm-hmm. like an actual physical an actual threat. physical threat. So there's, there's, that's again, we get a nice little teacher b- moment here of there's a division between physical safety and reputational harm. And physical safety is making sure you're still alive at the end of all of this, that you're safe, that you, uh, y- your personal information stays personal enough that you are not at physical risk, uh, y- that they're not showing up at your workplace, they're not sending things to your home, anything like that. And there are some, there are some structural things you can do to try and do that that include if you, um, addresses are vulnerable, physical addresses are very vulnerable, um, in that once people have them, you can't really do anything about that unless you move, and then just the people who come after you are at risk. So my strategy on that one is PO boxes. I haven't actually had a physical address that is linked to my name in several years now. Um, And I have found that particularly useful. Because, first of all, I move a lot, so I don't need to keep updating my addresses. But it also limits my exposure to risk. It's even things like my voter registration is to a P.O. box. Uh, There are ways that you can restrict access to your information that are put out in um, different states have different rules about this. It are mostly classified on if you're a victim of domestic violence or a victim of stalking. But you can do some of it proactively and actually get your information protected. So that's something to look at into your state's laws about whether or not you can protect that information. It's also, I think, important to look up um, at your state's laws about what constitutes stalking. Um, Because what I ended up, and what constitutes harassment, like what you can actually do with that information. Uh, Because when I took everything to um, all of those posts on Facebook and Twitter, um, and the fact that she keyed my car and the police report and everything, and I took all of that to um, the magistrate's office in Virginia, they told me that they couldn't do anything. They couldn't do anything because she had only showed up at my work once. She left when my boss told her to leave. The fact that she keyed my car after she left was sort of like a non-issue. Um, and she never made any direct threat of physical violence towards me in any of her posts. So had she just said once, I'm going to kill her, I would have been in a much better place rather than spending the last like month and a half of my residence in Virginia living in fear that she was going to find me or find my car or find where I was staying and show up there and like attack me there. So that's the chunk that gets into uh, when we wish we had our lawyer about the things (laughs) that we could actually do because they had prepared chunks on this and thus I didn't. Um, But so definitely you need to keep an archive of any threats against you. Uh, So my most notable time was I used to work for io9 and Gizmodo, which are part of the Gawker Media Group, uh, which is also part of Kokoto and Gamergate, was when I was first getting started. So I got to be swept up in that joy and wake up every morning to comment sections that were just full of the most gruesome, vile imagery that I refused to describe. Uh, I would actually take my contacts out or my glasses off in order to check comments and anything that was pink or any like humanish colors, it was insta-delete, just ban hammer all of them assume it's awful. Um, But during that time period, so I worked for them, roughly speaking, 700 days, during which I received 800 rape and death threats. 
Uh, so it was a little over one a day. And they're all in this gigantic archive. And I did work with a lawyer to decide what would constitute a real and actionable threat in my jurisdiction. At what point would it be important for me to notify? And I had to notify on absolutely none of them. I just keep the archive around. And I don't actually feel threatened by any of them because, I mean, half the time they couldn't even get my name right. Uh, the things I was getting threatened for were aliens are real, the Earth is flat, Pluto is a planet, uh, Canadian way of spelling things is deeply offensive, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> worth dying over. Um, that I once called the Cygnus spacecraft cute. That earned me a little rash of death threats that I was found very peculiar. I never knew solar panels on a spaceship were so enraging. They're um, ferocious. Yeah. They're well, can you imagine ferocious. if I said anything about SpaceX? Like, <laughs> wow, I would have had them like lining up outside my place if they could find it. <laughs> So yes, it's good to keep an archive of it, but it's also getting into the emotional side of things. It's important to also keep an archive of the good things because when you're a target of harassment, it gets to you, even when you know it's ridiculous, even when you know it's unfounded, even when you know this is like an extinction burst and it will pass as people get distracted by the next shiny, obnoxious thing on the internet. So I keep around every email of somebody saying that they love my work. I keep around... Every time I have a superior or a boss say, hey, that was a great piece, I had to edit three words and it went live. Every time in real life I have these great interactions that don't have an automatic digital archive of them, I'll write them up and document them. So that when I'm having those <laughs> days that are just like 800 people want me to die, maybe they have a point, I have an even bigger archive of warm, fuzzy things to remind me, no, 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 they're, they're the minority. They're the 1% of the people commenting and that everything else is okay. So how do you deal with the emotional aspects of it? Um, so I, the first time I posted it live on the internet, right, the, the like first time I did like a really big thing before my sex ed and dating career really got started, um, I posted uh, an article on exojane.com. Um, Home of some very friendly comment section. Oh, very. It was, you know, it wasn't actually as bad when I like posted. It was like a year before it started getting real sketch. Um, but I posted an article on like, I'm in a happy polyamorous relationship, right? Um, it was the first article I posted. It's also how I came out as polyamorous to my family on a site full of 2 million monthly viewers. Hey, at least you got paid for it. <laughs> all right. It wasn't that much, but all right, I'll take it. Um, but after that, I realized that I still wanted to write things and I still wanted to talk about things and that the work I was doing was important because I already knew that the work I was doing in sex education was important. I was working in a little shop at that point. Um, and so I knew that I was going to have to like go public, which meant I knew that I had to lay down some rules. And my rule to keep myself safe is whenever I post something online, I will read exactly five negative comments. At the point when I'm reading the comments that I get to comment number five that says, God, you're a fat whore and you should go kill yourself. That's when I say, I think it's time to take a bubble bath. <laughs> and I walk away from that. And sometimes I'll come back and check in later, but it's always in increments of five because that way I can see those good comments and I can see that I've read like 15 comments and now I'm only at the fifth comment where somebody is saying, oh, what was my favorite one? It was, um, you know, cancer is a virus that you get injected when you get your vaccinations. Ooh. And that's probably why you lost your lung. What? I um, followed up with a lovely, hopefully you die. And I was like, <laughs> It's like the trifecta of terrible there. Right? Where you're like, wow, you have no science and you're mean. <laughs> you have no redeeming qualities right There's now. Good nothing job. nothing about you that I like. Did they at um, least spell well and have good no. grammar? God, no. I of can show not, you. Never. I can literally show you. Um, you know, it was awful. Uh, but at the same time, when you get to those five, like, set a limit for yourself. Set a, you know, we always say don't read the comments. But I think for a lot of people, especially people who write and especially people who live publicly and especially people who live publicly but are not, like well known enough to get 800 yeah. threats in 70 days um we want to read the comments we want to know what people are saying about our work because that feedback is important feedback is important for us and so um i, I just think that it's important to like make sure that you're setting like a limit 
to make sure that you know when to walk away because otherwise you sit there and you're like you want to call it hate reading it's not hate reading it's self like you're internalizing hate at that point don't do that yeah it's definitely i uh, for uh, it's important to pick your battles about what you're going to talk about a lot of you in here understand that already and that you think carefully about some of the things you do in public because you don't want to deal with the consequences of how people are going to respond or you're not sure how they're going to respond and I mean, there's some things in, as a science communicator, that are hot button to topics. If I talk about climate change, guaranteed, it's going to have a very violent reaction. If I talk about vaccinations, there's going to be major reactions. If I talk about sexual harassment in science, there's going to be major reactions. So there's some articles I could predict in advance were going to cause me problems. And those ones, I would do things like sometimes I'd buy a bottle of wine first and <laughs> charge it to my <laughs> editor. There are times <laughs> where... I would say, all right, I'm ready to hit publish on this, but not until my hedgehog wakes up and I can start cuddling him. Um, so it's important to pick your battles. It's important to take breaks. And it's important to ask for and get support. And that support can be emotional or it can be logistical. So we talk about, like, don't feed the trolls. And there's all sorts of research now on actually don't feed the trolls is the most effective tactic. If you ignore them, they do eventually go away. But that doesn't mean you need to suffer in isolation. It means you can talk about it, just not to them. <laughs> talk about it to other people. Find people who understand, get support from them. Even do things like, hey, could you deal with my comment sections? I'll do yours tomorrow. Trade off on them. Like, take a break from Twitter and have other people report the abuse. Like, ask for help, get that help. Also, ask for mentors. That, I mean, I'm. I definitely know people who will get a lot more threats and a lot more nastiness than me. And I ask them, how do you deal with it? What are your tactics? What are your strategies? How do you deal with this? How do you process it? And that's where I've learned some of the things I've learned along the way. It's you don't need to make every mistake yourself. You're allowed to ask other people what mistakes they made, then not do them. Yeah, I definitely second the, the mentor thing. Um, I had a friend of mine's like tight with Brianna Wu and um, he like put us all into a chat together and he was like, you should talk about like what you're afraid of. And I'm like, really? You didn't even like not Ask even me an first. sentence. Not even like that's it. <laughs> Just gonna throw me in there. Um, and she was really great about like letting me know like some of the strategies that she keeps in place to keep herself safe and to keep herself emotionally um, recharged. I suppose would be the word I'd use. Yeah. And so there's an element of this as well that as you gain some element of power, you try and use that power to make the world a slightly better place. So this can be as simple as um, it is. R we are in the world of the internet mob. It is very easy to direct, direct hate upon a target, and that target does not actually need to deserve it in any way. Sometimes they can be terrible people. Sometimes they can have just said something silly. Sometimes they're completely innocent and have no idea what just hit them. Like uh, All those things happen. If you're in a position of power where you actually can have some influence, it's important to treat that with respect. It's punch up, don't punch down. It's always easy to take out the little guy. It's harder to actually go after the targets that, that need the attention and need the change. Um, did you <laughs> want to take the question that was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, uh, I don't have a question. It's, uh, it's just a story, what you said about support. Um, uh, at the Calgary Expo, we, uh, well, I'm just speaking as a general volunteer, I can't offer mm -hmm. much other information. Uh, we had a group, a gamer gate group, put up a booth there. Yeah, uh, it was back in 2015. Yeah. Oh. Oh. oh, that was a very exciting mic. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. In 2015, the Honey Badger Brigade uh, set up a GamerGate booth because they are a GamerGate support site. Um, they and they did it completely. They just uh, Alice and TMN who is one of the heads of the Honey Badger Brigade, set it up, applied as a webcomic, because she has a webcomic. Fine. And then she set up Gamergate all over it. That Bait was on switch. Yeah. And then that night, uh, she went to... She and another Gamergate guy, Sage Gerald, went to a panel uh, that one of my friends, Stephanie Chan, was at women into comics, just women talking about getting how they got in the comics, what they like about comics, and they tried their best to derail it. Uh, fortunately, we had, um, okay, to get to the end of it there, uh, we basically told them to leave because they had violated the terms of agreement, which is that one of the things you, you cannot sell merchandise uh, that 
is about rape jokes and they were selling you know that oh god that what the heck is her name for uh, that that dull dead-eyed looking soulless character that gamergate has the um i have no idea their name and that actually mm-hmm. makes me pretty happy but like that's a piece of information i don't need in my life my was horrible. yeah it was, yeah. Ho- it was horrible but the <laughs> character was based on a rape joke and as such because of that and the bait and switch that they pulled and the harassment that they pulled they were asked to leave so in terms of support all the volunteers uh we said hey let's help each other let's make sure that all of our profiles are are strong and at least on facebook there uh, mm-hmm. and we all helped each other out to make sure that we were stronger against that kind of thing and it really did help a lot out a lot for us because uh it was like a m- minor blip but it doesn't take much to get the gators going. Yeah. yeah. So there are a couple of, again, a couple of things in there that we can pull out. So one of them is that um, if you start doing things like public speaking events or if you're attending events, knowing that there is a harassment po- policy, how it functions, who you report to is all really, really important. And if you want to go somewhere that doesn't have a harassment policy, asking them to put one in place can be remarkably effective. It is becoming less and less tenable for organizations to not have some awareness of the impact of harassment in whatever form it takes. Just on a happy note, their booth was removed and uh, the cosplay is not consent sign was stuck in their place. (laughs) It's not always good. And and the booth next door got some extra space, so happy ending. Um, Oh, we like happy endings. I speak at a lot of different cons and I've been spoiled because I do a lot of like sex cons, um, sex ed cons, like kinky cons, that sort of thing. Um, And they have impeccable harassment proceedings because if you're going to a con where half the people are naked, you have to, like you have to. Um, But I've been really lucky um, to speak here and then at Awesome Con in DC for a couple years. Um, I've been really lucky at some of these like these cons that I was really nervous about going into it where I've gone into to awesome con and when I was having like the issue with my mm-hmm. ex and I like gave photos and names of my ex and his girlfriend and I was like they might show up at my panel I don't know and they were like not a problem and they gave the names to like my volunteer staffer and they pulled another staffer in just to like make sure that that person was there to help me out just to keep an eye on the door and make sure that they didn't come through if they did show at all they didn't um and any time that i've worked with any sort of uh with awesome con i haven't needed it here but i've been very easily able to go up to one of the one of the (laughs) grown-ups and and say hey i'm having a bit of a concern what do (laughs) and they're usually pretty good about like if they can't help me pointing me in the direction of somebody who can so this sort of giving people an awareness that there is a situation it again it applies to all over in life where you can do it at work you can do it at your offices you can do it at uh, university campuses you can do it in restricted buildings anything like that Uh, and if you know that you are currently actively being attacked being targeted uh, you can do things like notify your credit card companies notify your bills make sure you've got a Uh, locked accounts with a nice secure password on them and tell them hey I might be the target of of attack right now please be aware of any attempts at social engineering please be aware of any attempts of charging things in unusual locations and logins from IP addresses that are nowhere where you know where I am I'm not traveling these things are happening right now and that can also put people on alert it can take some explaining as to what is going on because it's, it's kind of a mixed blessing that the word doxing is not yet a common vocabulary. It's great because it means so many people have had no need to know what that means in their lives, which good for them. I'm, I, I'm kind of envious. Um, and it's a little bit bad because then you have to try and get through and explain everything. If you're in a situation where you think that you might end up getting swatted, again, calling the local police department and saying, hey, this is a thing that's happening. If you get my address, please make sure to knock with your fists, not with your boots. <laughs> it is <laughs> a problem more in the U.S. than in Canada, but it's still an important reminder. Um, and then on the final thing... I'm on a t-shirt, though. <laughs> 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 knock with your fists, not with your boots. Yes. It, I, I personally feel like that should be a general philosophy in the entire United States, but, you know, that's my Canadianism showing. <laughs> um, and, and just on, like, a final chunk of the whole, make sure your accounts are secure. You can also turn on two-factor authorization on a whole lot of things right now, and that saves a whole lot of problems if 
you know right away when your phone starts bleeping saying, hey, are you trying to log in here? Are you trying to log in here? Are you trying to log in here? And you go, oh, I have a problem. And no, I'm not. Go ahead. Um, well Make sure to use the microphone because they're recording, I think. Oh, okay. Well, because of the do uh, about the doxing and uh, the swatting, um, my my bank actually alerted me on my phone because I was doing make use my credit card for a lot of charges this weekend, and it says, "Hey, you've had a lot of charges on your credit card, and they've been declined. Say yes to have them not declined." <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. So that that's something you should if your bank offers it, sign up for that. And for the swatting, uh, that's what's important about uh, making sure your police do know about it. You at least get a paper trail started. So if someone does give your address, try to stick the SWAT team on you. Uh, yeah. They're like, um, yeah, this person's been harassed and they let us know about it. So um, we have this paper trail. It's like, um, so you won't get swatted if that happens. Well, hopefully not. There's hopefully still, not. It <laughs> still happens sometimes. Uh, so there's a really, really nice resource called Crash Override that will actually walk you through step by step. They now have an app that will actually take you through step by step on how to lock down and secure your accounts. And yes, it won't do it to the highest possible level, but it will do it as a, a better than you would normally do level if you're a non-expert on it of at least thinking about the types of things to do. So that will help you out with getting your digital life secured. I was going to add, I don't know if a lot of people realize a lot of places offer on-demand passwords now. Uh, I know my Yahoo account, when I want to log in, they text a password to my phone. There's never the same. Yeah. It's, don't reuse your passwords. I hope we're past that stage of security. Don't reuse your passwords. It's also the easiest thing to do. Just don't reuse them. I set my, um, I set an alarm on my, uh, on my phone. Every three months, I go into all of my accounts. I have a list of the accounts that require like two-factor authorization um, and authentication, whatever. I don't, who the fuck cares? Uh, <laughs> we got the point in this after Thank 10. Thank you. Good enough. Uh, and I have a list of those in like an event on my Google Calendar every three months to go back through and check them and make sure all of my information is updated correctly. Especially now, this is really important because I had to go through and do that recently because all of those like emergency addresses were sent to my ex-husband and the phone like the phone numbers often sent to my ex-husband is like a secondary emergency phone number so if he wanted to he could have gotten into all my accounts and so i'm really glad that i was able to get you in there notice that before right? <laughs> uh so a, a big chunk of this coming out right here what like the big overall theme of this is you cannot have privacy without security it's privacy is effectively it's any sharing of any information without your consent and it doesn't really matter what that information is. It's any information about you shared without your consent is a violation of your privacy. And in order to protect it, you need some form of security. And all we're really talking about is the type of information changes the type of security. Sometimes it's you restrict that information at all, that you restrict the existence of that information, PO boxes instead of physical addresses for registration. Sometimes it's restricting who has access to particular types of personal information. So using temporary Google Talk phone numbers instead of your mobile number in order to test out whether or not somebody is trustworthy um, or just for sheer convenience sake of having perpetually disposable phone numbers. Um, and then some of them are the physical safety things, which is the notification of your workplace or the police or anyone like that when you are actively under a targeted threat and sometimes it's emotional safety of reaching out for help so it's all part of a theme yeah go well, ahead I was gonna say also for uh, password ma uh, password managers especially some of the good ones are a godsend for uh, oh yeah. securing sites because then you can get those nice beefy 40 character passwords can't crack them quite so easily and changing it is just a couple of clicks Yep, password managers are like essential because you don't want to reuse passwords. You don't want to have a password system that it means you're probably not going to remember all your passwords. So password managers are the way to go. My password well is long and intense and well incredibly chaotic well and it changes for every well site. I had a like I just yeah, change like a one aside. thing in it, like at random. It's I and have then to write of course, it down. Then you can also be me and like lock yourself out of all your accounts on a regular basis. <laughs> Like that, especially switching back and <laughs> forth across the Canadian-U.S. border where I have different sets of information and technically m my legal name is shortened in one country versus the other. It just, yeah, I, anytime I spend too long on one side of the border, I go back and I'm like, I don't know who I am anymore. Can someone <laughs> tell me? I just, I can't access my money. I don't know where my keys are. I just, 
I'll just wander the streets until a friend finds me and brings me inside. You sound drunk. <laughs> it's good. That's really what it is. You it's sound really drunk. It's crossing you don't the know what your name is. is. <laughs> but what I was going to say is for me, I worked in, uh, work in cybersecurity. I have been for more than a few years. And for me, actually, a lot of this, a lot of, you know, I knew about doxing as kind of a background peripheral thing, knew what it was and people did it, but never really paid a lot of attention to it, especially in the course of my job, primarily because a lot of the threats I've had to deal with through corporate is significantly different, especially 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But actually the thing that was the eye opener for me was actually Gamergate, where, you know, reading about it and understanding, hey, there's a, essentially if you break it down, an employee of a company essentially being attacked at a personal level, no, you know, for absolutely no fault of her own. No yeah. It's totally something I find terrifying is that for me, every time my career gets like does better, I end up higher profile, which puts me at greater risk. Mm -hmm. And I've always got this nagging feeling of like, that bad dating choice I made back in the year, is that going to come back and haunt me? Like, are all those like small mistakes I made in high school, somebody just going to come on out and see how much they can damage my reputation just because they can. And it doesn't even need to be truthful. Like, that's the bit you can't protect against what people say about you. And on a slightly, like, a, a related note of that, it's you also can't control what your friends are, are sharing about you. Is operational security to my mom is, is not a thing, right? Like, <laughs> talking to my mom about hey, maybe you shouldn't tag me in this photo where you've got your house address in it, <laughs> was a very awkward conversation, but it needed to happen. Yeah. So it's, I kind of wonder if it's slightly easier in the US where you have more of a military context and more people might know about the concept of operational security. You'd just be like, yeah, just treat me that way. But in uh, Canada, it's definitely not, a, not an easy conversation with mom. So one of the, the things that you um, touched on in there is the bringing shit up from like way back in the day. Um, and this is something that I, that I get with in a lot of the activist communities and a lot of the sex positive communities that I have is that one person will make one mistake 10 years ago and it's now 10 years later and somebody's bringing it up and using it to discredit their entire career. Um, and you see this, this is a common thing that happens. And if this is happening to you, and it is a thing that you said, and you have learned, and you have grown from it, the best way to handle it is to apologize. Yeah. And you have to apologize correctly. <laughs> you cannot do an, I'm so sorry you were offended, but I've grown and changed. It is a, I'm so sorry for what I've said. I'm sorry that I hurt people. I have grown and changed, but I understand why what I had said was wrong. Yeah. It's, I'm sorry, but doesn't work. Correct. Or, I'm sorry that you feel that way. The classic non-apology. Yeah. No. It is, I'm sorry for hurting someone. Because you did. If they're bringing it up and they're saying that that happened, then you did. And you should apologize. And at the end of the day, it just makes you look a hell of a lot better if you know how to apologize properly. Oh, man. Making mistakes in public is no fun. No. Not even a little. And it will happen with everybody. So this actually, um, I'm going to be doing a, a panel on this track, I think, tomorrow night tomorrow afternoon on how science fiction impacts public policy and whenever we get to these conversations about the internet never forgets i get starting to think about spider robinson's melancholy elephants and it starts off as a tale of perpetual copyright and how we'll have sad sad artists in the end when they can never come up with original idea ever again but i think of it in the modern context of we as societies at some point are going to have to have some sort of willful forgetting because if we perpetually remember every mistake everyone has ever made for all eternity, we aren't going to be able to function as a society. Not ev like Nobody is that perfect. We just aren't. So that's a cultural shift that I'm waiting for that I hope catches up with like the sci-fi aspect of things soon. It's the entire idea of the island. If you keep kicking people off the island because they've messed up, uh, eventually there ain't going to be nobody on the island. <laughs> it's a good thing that there's continents. Right? Um, so I would like to touch on real fast on like different ways to take care of yourself mentally um, through all of this because especially even if you're just preparing for this like this is exhausting all of these things that you have to do if you want to be a public person on the internet if you want to you know avoid harassment on the internet you want to know what it vaguely sounds like you're never going like? to avoid harassment you're never going to avoid it is how do you manage harassment you want to know what this sounds like this entire panel 
well, you know, you should um, never walk home in the dark and don't cover both of your ears and don't wear short skirts and don't drink too much and always go out with a friend who's sober as well and make sure you have cab money to go home and all of that same thing. I'm going to get the microphone there so it can be recorded. <laughs> Where is, you were saying that, and I remember you from the um, uh, yesterday on the uh, on the harassment. The revenge porn. Very, yeah, the revenge one, slightly different, but yeah. same story. Um, and none of that entitles you to anything or any kind of act action against you, but where is the line between personal responsibility and opening yourself up so to that type of thing how do you define that because i think that's the mistake most people make whether you're an olympic swimmer doing bong hits at a party where people have cell phones i mean you got to kind of know what's well, going to happen with so something like that there's it's again it's this privacy is a concept of any information being shared without your consent and that is that is a cultural issue at its heart is if we all had a totally different culture and that it was completely scorned to share anybody else's private information we'd be having very different conversations but instead we get down to this in order to have privacy you need security in order to have security well that's a mixture of technology and actions that's things that you have to do to use the technology and sometimes the technology doesn't exist and sometimes the policy doesn't exist and sometimes the laws don't exist and those are things we need to be asking for those are things we need to be aggravating for those are things that we need to try and convince our lawmakers are worth protecting and in all likelihood they're only going to decide they're worth protecting when they get burned themselves and so the a lot of this only became a sort of concept of well maybe we should say encrypt username databases after the Ashley Madison hacks where we had a whole bunch of straight white older men were all exposed for their sins suddenly we cared a lot more <laughs> than about any other target group that's been hit um, so one of the things that I want to touch on less of the like more on the like uh, social aspect yeah. to that um, is the concept of like personal responsibility versus like deserving because we always have this conversation of well you know nobody deserves this thing but like maybe if they were more careful that's that's not it in a perfect world i should be able to not have a password on any of my accounts and nobody should bother me nobody should bother me in a perfect world i should be able to walk down the street bare ass naked and nobody would touch me nobody would say anything inappropriate to me this is not a perfect world and nobody is at fault and nobody is at blame if they do not follow steps and something happens to them it just means that instead we say this sucks i'm sorry that this happens to happen to you here's what we can do to make it happen to you less in the future and that's how you step past that idea of the personal responsibility because i don't i don't have this idea of like personal responsibility as like a belief system of like you are responsible for making sure all your accounts are locked down like yeah you should do it but if you don't that's not like <laughs> it's not the end of the world you're in a especially interesting case i mean you you're, it's your career that puts you out you on the, you know rebecca you sort of are in a in a career oh yes that, it, that a byproduct is Exposure to probably a lot of unwanted harassment. You're just a oh, I would say that I get a lot of harassment just for doing my job. The number I, um, of times people decide to introduce me I as the uh, sexy scientist is really quite absurd. He's referring to my work, and yeah. my sex work, yeah, my like my like non-sex ed sex work, my like cam work and things. Yeah, yeah. Which is uh, <laughs> like there's several levels of of confusion here, and we if we're going to keep chatting back and forth, we're going to need to pass her job the is back. way more harassment. Like people are less likely to harass me, yeah, right? Anyway. Right. It's only if we're talking like Z grade, <laughs> like w way down on that list. So there's. There's another question. Yeah, it's. <laughs> you've been trying to ask your question for like easily half the panel. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to comment first off what you were saying about being a, the perfect world versus reality. Uh, I deal with that all the time. I deal with a lot of uh, high school kids specifically. I. I run a youth group and uh, so I was looking for like suggestions advice whatnot to pass along to kids as far as keeping themselves 
Oh yeah, so yeah, this is harassment because it's real common in the schools and whatnot. Yeah, and, and it is definitely something where I mean, depending on which surveys you ask, over sixty percent of people report harassment. Over twenty percent of women or people who identify as as feminine genders are reporting being sexually harassed. That increases with age, uh, with uh, decreasing age. So it increases inversely to age. The younger the girls are, the more likely they are to be harassed. Uh, and about ten percent of women have had. N nudes or partial nudes of themselves passed on without their consent and revenge porn is only illegal in some places at this point when you start looking at who is doing the harassing men tend to be harassed by equal mix of men and women and women are mostly getting harassed by men so there's huge cultural aspects at play here and then we add in the social sociological things which is about how women are perceived in re relation to sex where women are hugely pressured to send personal private images of themselves as part of the courtship process which men are not and men actually just flat out send unsolicited dick pics is like <laughs> that's a thing i have several hundred of those too that just get sent to me i don't even count them in the threat you know file do? i'm just like Wait, it's my collage if you if you feel really like just really i don't know not masochistic but snarky yes i send photos of like penile surgeries back <laughs> Just like, and here's how you can fix that. <laughs> Usually, and there's like, there's one, I can send it to you if you want. It's my favorite to use because people like, all these dudes that send me these dick pics are just like, ah, oh, what is that? And I'm like, yes, that is the um, like dorsal. <laughs> there's all, that is what will happen if you continue to bother me. Right. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of disproportional things that happen towards particularly teenage girls. Uh, and I mean, this is the, like, it sounds like ridiculous advice, but things like, encrypting the nudes that they're going to be passing on anyway but that's not advice you can give as a teacher nope like that is not on the list of things you get to say to them <laughs> instead you get to point them at crash override and say well, here's you how you can secure your accounts here's how you can step through basic uh, techniques and hey by the way you're not alone this is a thing it will happen and here's some statistics so you can make slightly better choices on your risk reward ratios of is that tiny momentary buzz of getting their approval by sending a photo worthwhile for the fact that there's a not insignificant chance it's going to keep getting passed. Um, I would also, you know, you could just say like, hey, just encrypt your photos before you send them. Yes. All photos. Any and photo. And every that photo. Does, that really only gets it so it goes from, from you to your recipient who can then yeah. decrypt it and do whatever they want with it. So it yeah. still doesn't actually solve that problem. Um, in terms of when I do any like sort of like... Technology only goes so far. There's also social aspects. When I do any sort of education with um, with teens, specifically teenage girls, um, because I do deal a lot with sex education with teenagers, mostly because I work in communities where I say, hey, I am really happy to teach sex ed to your kids if you don't want to do it. And then there's an entire community of parents like, oh, thank God. <laughs> that was my stepsister's job. <laughs> Which it's meant fun. Yeah. It's a great job. It was great having my stepsister come to the classroom and give all the demos. <laughs> and I'm the only person whose name she knew. Um, but uh, one of the things that like I, I talk about with that is that even if your parents are, if you think that your parents are not going to be receptive to what you have to say in an instance like this, that they need to identify an adult that they can trust. Somebody over the age of 18 who like knows how to get in contact with a lawyer and the cops and everything like that, who knows how to calm them down. I don't care what... The, I, it could be a pastor. It could be like their mom's best friend. It could be their cool aunt. I don't care. <laughs> find yeah, a an find adult. an adult that they can trust to talk to, to have these conversations with somebody who can say, "I'm hearing everything you're saying, and I'm so sorry that you're going through this, and I really want to help you. I also think that we need to talk to your parents, and I'm happy to go with you, and I'm happy to talk to them with you, and I'm happy to let them know what's going on, and I want to make sure you're okay. But we also need to bring this to the attention of the people who can, you know pay for they, the lawyer yeah. and like and deal with the fact that now them. there's like transmitting of child born right like, exactly there's um but that's high school that's kids hard are a whole mess of ugly in this <laughs> they, it's it's a dangerous world uh, for them in many you ways pay me enough to go back all right do we have i think we're we're actually approaching near the the end of the time slot here so it's uh any 10 minutes awesome more questions yes yeah okay this was actually kind of a, a sensitive issue because um, one of my worst stalkers um, has mental difficulties, I want to say. Um, he's actually kind of bright, but he has the mental maturity of a, uh, emotional maturity of a seven-year-old. And he's, every con we go to, 
that we're both at, he like follows me all over the place. And the only thing I could think of to do is say, hi, hotel and then venue security, can you talk to this guy and tell him to leave me alone? Because just, just, if I try to tell him, he gets really defensive and... And it escalates. It escalates. Like, can you help me de-escalate this? And uh, it got to a point where I actually had to have security escort me to the hotel room because he was trying to follow me to my hotel room. And I'm just wondering if there's other, if you guys have ideas that maybe I haven't thought of yet that can be helpful when you have that situation. So this is the blurring of the online and the uh, physical again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. this is, this is a, a constant question of things about once your physical location is known, it's as in all of security, once the physical location is compromised, everything is compromised. <laughs> yeah, it's, like it's amazing how often that, that axiom comes true. Uh, so this is something I often wonder about in terms of, so again, I, I have to advertise where I'm talking. It's, a, it's part of my job to get people to show up, but that also means the people who I really don't want to be there know exactly where to find me. Uh, so really what you can, al the only things you can really do are look to the security of the institution, to look to the, the people who are uh, responsible for the organizations going on, and to notify them of the issue and request their help. Like we do not live in a society where you should do vigilante justice for your own defense. It is, it is strongly discouraged despite the number of superhero costumes we have wandering around in halls right now. <laughs> So it's definitely, it's the, it's the call a friend option, but call a friend is call security. Yeah. It's, or, yeah, or getting escorted around. It's, <laughs> it's unfortunate. And again, society changes would be really, really nice. I'd love to see, I have so many cultural changes I'd love to see just seep through the system. If I could just, you know, find that magical switch to start tweaking how we view society. Um, but until then work within the systems we have. One of the things that I do, because um, I've only had this issue like once or twice, is pretty much every con that I go to, I request a second badge. Um, and the second badge is my emotional support person. Um, yep. They're the person who comes with me. They're the ones who grab me water because they see me up here talking and they're like, she's like licking her lips. I mean, she's thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> and they're the ones that like go and grab me the granola bar because I'm like standing and people are asking me questions and I'm in four inch heels. I'm like, oh my God, I really love all of you, but I'm so tired. <laughs> um, and they're also the person who, when I'm feeling uncomfortable with somebody or when somebody's like getting a little too close or a little too questionable, because like I said, I do a lot of sex con. And so there are a lot of times when I'm like, my cup spilleth over out of my dress or, <laughs> or my corset or my lingerie that I'm speaking in or whatever. Um, and so like I keep somebody with me just to make me feel secure and supported. Yeah. Somebody who I can be like, you need to go get security or somebody who can very simply be like, thank you, we're leaving now. And like... Yep, Usher me I out. have one of those too. It's right. it's the plus one badge. Yeah. Uh, I I usually term mine security because then they get to go into places they aren't otherwise allowed to go. Um, they can also be called a gopher. Uh, and if you get sufficiently a high enough level of of celebrityness, they actually assign you people whose job it is, and they also like navigate crowds for you and everything like that. One day I will achieve that. <laughs> I think it's I occasionally, of the yeah. stands, like occasionally I currently get service elevators and that's like my my <laughs> magic badge right there. So Brian Hansen. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Very rarely. Um, so yeah, the the extra human being to help you out. Uh, some conventions actually do buddy systems like this, where you can find impromptu ones of people who escort you from place to place. Uh, university campuses also are really really good at doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so you can also create those systems at work if you've got somewhere where you need support. Arrange with other people. Ask a friend. Ask security. Ask coworkers. Partner up with somebody else who has their own concerns and look out for each other. It's we are but small and squishy and fragile humans, <laughs> but we can make things better by taking care of each other. Uh, how else do you believe that large social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter can better improve their security? <laughs> uh, oh, uh, oh uh, because um, I won't. I won't name my friend. My friend's names, but. Bo both of them, you know, they, they talk about racism and that, and Facebook has just gotten so ridiculous. A a at this point, they have multiple accounts. Luckily, they have a support system. Like I I'm one of their friends, and they have numerous other friends that they turn to whenever to get a 30-day ban. But it's like as soon as the, the uh, their account comes back on, boom, they get banned for, s for just saying, hey, uh, something as innocuous to say, hey, this was racist, this is bad. So I um, could not care less about the like security with the, the like um, 
passwords and things like that about Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly not when women who have had uh, mastectomies can't be shirtless on Facebook. Mm -hmm. However, there are like graphic images of beaten women with rape jokes next to them, and those are completely allowed. And when reported, they get issued back with a, oh, there was nothing wrong here. Same thing for Twitter. Um, the reality is that they don't care. <laughs> Yeah, they like, just they don't care because there's so much pushback from so many women and from so many minority uh, groups who are experiencing so much harassment on a daily basis that half the time they just don't do anything they won't yet, you know any NBC Olympics clips that ended up online came down within seconds weird yeah. uh, so there is if you have ideas of how to fix abuse at Twitter currently Peter Seibel is recruiting people for his team to be paid to do this uh, I know nothing else about that. He has done a last-minute recruitment drive, which, of, of course, is the greatest way to get diversity in your team, is to say, hey, wait, I forgot about you. Can you join me now? <laughs> um, but if you do have ideas and you do want to get paid for that, apparently they're hiring at Twitter. Yeah, oh, because one? Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, because the really, really cynical part of me believes that the only reason that Leslie Jones got the support that, sh that she did after that first round of hate from... Everyone? Yeah, and especially by like Milo, is because she was just in that big blockbuster movie, and there was a yep. lot of attention yeah. on her. There's, and she had a, a position of power, which made her both mm -hmm. a target and somebody to protect. Now, one thing I do find slightly positive in all of that is that we are now at a tipping point in our society where it is politically expedient for a presidential candidate to voice support for somebody who is a target of abuse and to condemn the people abusing her. Like that is, that right there is a new thing we have not seen before. Previously, it's just been ignored. So maybe, maybe we're at the start of getting to a point where we as a society are actually treating this as a serious problem and start doing some meaningful changes instead of allowing people to have the crap beaten out of them all the time. Yeah, some, um, some quick things that are like sort of related. Um, I'm very much of the uh, if you see something, say something camp. <laughs> um, if you see that somebody is being harassed online, hit the report button for the people harassing them. Yeah. Like if you see someone's and being harassed some online, support for them at the right, same time. Message I them and let them know if you need anything. Like feel free to message me and let me know. Like if you need to talk about this. Um, similarly, if you are on any sort of like. I don't know, <laughs> drive that says, hey, we forgot about you. <laughs> Why don't you come join us and help us out? I'm going to say this, and I'm really sorry. No, I'm not. Um, if you are like a white dude in a group of other white dudes talking about harassment and like things that affect non-white dudes, possibly maybe consider saying, huh, Where's the diversity in this room? Uh, this is as, uh, so I like data, right? I'm a scientist, I really like data. <laughs> and one of the most beautiful data points that I have ever seen is that the more diverse your group is, the better they are at solving problems and the more money a company makes. Like it is just like flat out that direct. If you wanna solve a problem, gather up people who are as ridiculously different as you can <laughs> possibly find, who have radically different life experiences than your own, and you will solve every problem in a way that will make you more money and you'll do it faster and more efficiently. So uh, like, flat out, diversity is amazing in all of its possible variations and definitions and descriptions. It's really effective. Yay, science. <laughs> <laughs> Last question? Anyone want to do a last question? Oh, yeah. All right. Somebody we've never heard yeah, from before. Yeah, yeah. There's, can someone quick throw, throw the mic up on him? We haven't thrown it once. Oh. There Yay. we go. Yeah. <laughs> the padded cube of throwiness. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you guys could comment on this scenario that happened at my work. Um, I work at a small startup. It's only three of us. And um, I'm kind of de facto the IT guy. So... A delivery guy has a pleasant conversation with my coworker, never comes back again. She then starts getting all sorts of unwanted emails from this dude, not just on her work email, but also on her personal Gmail account. No idea how he got that. Um, come to find out, he doesn't work for that delivery service anymore, so there's no recourse there. Um, she bans him, you know, blocks it all, all communication 
but he continues to keep making new accounts and it's sort of like an ongoing thing it's not violent so there's no law enforcement response but it's certainly unwanted and uncomfortable yeah. and i feel like me being in this position at work uh, is there anything that i could do here you know um so you can ask her if she would like your help to start with like that's the first yeah, thing is is, is yeah all right so you got her opt-in for please help uh do you have any way of of being able to filter out the emails before he gets to them like have white lists on there of here are people who are supposed to be emailing her everyone who's not on that list gets a human screen first before we send it on uh, not like really we're i mean we're a new startup so we're reaching out to all kinds of new people all the time and you know we have to be a lot more open to yeah so is that something that, that could be um, employed in her personal email like first and foremost, like her personal Gmail account, set up something like that, and then, um, I mean, the other work one is sort of complicated. And or can right. you change her work email address, or can you forward it, or can you have somebody else screen her emails before she sees them? I mean, I, like, there's a couple of ways to go about that. There's technological solutions and there's human solutions. And human mm -hmm. solutions is the call a friend answer of somebody like this is we totally did this at Gawker is we'd swap off who was dealing with each other's comments sections who's dealing with each other's emails just somebody going through and being like delete 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 or archive 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 just get those out of the email box because we can tell what they are right away and then leave them to deal with their normal email um, the technological solutions are more complicated and quite honestly I'm not a programmer and I, I can't go into the level of detail necessary of how do you do you try and, and solve that particular problem? You all should bond. Exactly. After. I'm sure somebody in this room has a solution to that. Uh, oh, we've got somebody at the front who has a solution. Can we get the microphone thrown back up here to her? The Ask the Room solution. Multi um, many brains, many backgrounds. Well, I actually work in IT. Um, and I also have a one-person business. Um, and one tool that I use, it's a free tool. It's called spamcop.net. And it actually... If you're not technologically savvy, you can like just copy and paste your email, including your headers, into this little tool, and it will parse the headers for you and tell you all the abuse uh, addresses for their individual ISPs, and sends the spam reports for you, and just report it as spam, and go on with your day. And I have gotten so many accounts deleted for people trying to spam my uh, business account because of that. Fantastic, and I think, did you have also another yeah, addition? That, that was actually the exact <laughs> All right, and we've got somebody in the back there who's uh, also. And I think after this, we're yeah. probably at time. Yep. So as a, a kind of a personal hobby project and maybe future startup, I've been doing some work on text classification, which is basically the solution that's used for most spam filtering. Um, I've also taught it at various points to recognize hostility and, and harassment. So um, I was moderating a subreddit and I had a bot running this software and if a comment was too hostile, it just got deleted immediately before it could turn into a, a back and forth flame war. And I'm trying to think of applications for that in other contexts where you might want that software filtering your email as well as a spam filter filtering your email. Yep possible futures. I mean, at the moment, I know that uh, attempts at doing fully AI comment moderation end up going a little bit off the rails, uh, that it still requires humans to identify abuse sometimes, particularly when people start getting like all thrown shade or gotten snarky about it. It's a little more difficult for AIs to identify. Uh, but certainly, I definitely, that is, that is part of the future I hope to have one day. All right, I think we are at time. So, as a, a quick little recap of things to do, try and lock down your, phys your physical information. Uh, let people know on alert when you have a situation brewing. Reach out for support. Up your security. Um, pick your battles and know you aren't alone in this and help each other out. And take care of yourself. Yeah, give each other hugs. <laughs> even little digital fuzzy hugs. Drink your wine. Pet your cat. Yeah, consensual hugs. Don't hug people who don't want to be hugged have a nap i don't care take yeah, care yeah, of you self-care is super important with all this yeah, bubble Please baths. don't forget that infinite oh, bubble, bubble baths. baths all right thank you guys very much have a fantastic evening uh i think you can find me online at mika mckinnon on twitter what's your uh, online i'm chunk? the frisky fairy all one word on literally everything so there we go have a great night <laughs>